All right, well, one of the things that you will need to be able to do for your uh, upcoming homework assignment, and one of the things that you will want to know how to do in general in the context of development with SAP, and I suppose you could say this isn't really an ABAP thing necessarily, except for the fact that it allows us to create a resource that we will use in our ABAP development. I want to talk for a second here about creating database tables in the SAP system. Remember we talked about last time that ABAP does not give us syntactical uh, commands that will allow us to create tables or other things of that sort. So if we desire to create a database table, we have to do so by using the ABAP dictionary. And it's not a challenging prospect. In fact, it's easier than some of the other things that we've had to do in the ABAP dictionary. Uh, but I want to take a moment here and walk you through that. The big thing, of course, to keep in mind is that um, pr probably the most important part of this whole process is having a table uh, predefined in your brain or set of tables predefined uh, before you actually go in and begin the table creation process. And, and that's something we won't spend a lot of time talking about or really any time talking about because I'll presume that you um, have, are already familiar with uh, the concepts behind table creation and key values and fields and other things from other classes that you have taken. And so we will just focus on the actual mechanics of the table creation process. We always want to make sure when we create things in the ABOB dictionary that we begin them with our login name. And so mine is ZN001. And so I will start with that and then underscore. And I'll just call this particular table uh, demo223 in light of the fact that today being February 23rd. And uh, I know that this table doesn't exist. So um, I will go ahead and click on the create button. And this will take me into the table creation process in the ABOP dictionary. You can see that my cursor is flashing on the short description field. Uh, like other things that we create in the ABOP dictionary, we always have to give a description uh, to provide metadata. This table is going to be fairly nonsensical, uh, but I will just call this a table um, of stuff for class 2 slash 23 slash 2017. You should give your table a more meaningful uh, description. And you'll notice the other thing on this field that is, or on this particular screen that is required is delivery class. And if I choose the search help there, um, I, I see what I'm being asked about here. I, I have a set of choices. And essentially this is a uh, asking me to describe how this table will be used in the system. You notice A is an application table, basically a database table to be used in applications that's going to contain perhaps master data or transaction table or a customizing table, uh, which has maintenance only allowed by the customer and SAP will not in any way touch this table uh, at any point in the future related to system migrations or other work. Uh, L uh, is a table for storing temporary data. Uh, G is a temporary, or excuse me, a customizing table protected against SAP update, only inserts allowed. Uh, e is a control table. Yeah, you can see system, two different varieties of system tables here. What we will always use is application table because we're going to be creating a table for use in our particular applications. Now, there are a lot of things that I can set about my table, and some of these we will look at, but quite a number of these things are optional or have appropriate default values, and so we'll wind up not talking about them. But clearly, the one thing we do need to define are the fields that will compose our table, and so I have selected the fields tab to navigate to that. And this should look familiar based on things that we have seen previously 
in our work in the ABAB dictionary. We've looked at tables that were already created for us and seen screens that were like this. Well, let's get started with our table design. And, and admittedly, this is going to be a pretty nonsensical table. But the one thing that we want to generally incorporate in all of our tables is the font field. We talked last time about how that allows us to have client-specific control of data. And so it is very, very traditional, unless we have a good reason not to do this, to put a Mont field and to make that both a key field and a field where an initial value is required. And to make it nice and easy for us to remember, in fact, the data type associated with this is the standard type of also Mont. Okay, so the spelling here is pretty critical. M-A-N-D-T is the appropriate way to spell that. And the very nice thing about this is, if we set this up in this fashion, by the way, with it being the first field listed, that's very important, then we will see that SAP will actually manage this particular field for us. When we put things in the table, it will automatically tag them with our client number based on our login. And when we pull things out, unless we use the client specified syntax, we'll only get back the data for our particular client. So we talked about that last time. Now I'm going to add some other fields to my database table. And, and you might recall that when we were together, well, let's start with this. Let's to store someone's uh, social security number. So I'm going to create a field here and I'll just call it SSN. And I will, in fact, make that a key field. Yes, sir. Absolutely. No, that's a very good question. And you will see there are both standard tables and other tables out there that don't use Mont, but I'm going to guess that 95% plus incorporate that. So I'm going to add a social security number field. I'll make it part of the key. Um, so I need a, a data type for this. Now remember, I have two different choices for how I can define data types. This I can type in now under data element is where I put in a data type that exists in the ABAP dictionary. If I don't want to use a type from the ABAP dictionary, I want to use a user-defined type, or in this case, a database table creator-defined type then I can hit this toggle right here, which allows the right portion of the screen to have its fields entered. And I can specify the description of the data type here. And that's what I'll do for social security number, just for the sake of illustration. We will say that, in fact, this is a uh, numeric string or numeric text of num c. And I think a social security is, what is it, nine digits long? Yes, OK. So length of nine. And you always want to get in a habit of putting in a description. Notice I use the standard system type that's already in the ABAP dictionary. It pulled the description associated with that. So I didn't have to type in that documentation. And so this will just be, um, you know, social security number. You don't need to be verbose here. You're just using it and so it's pretty obvious what's going on here. Now let's leverage uh, some of the data types we created previously, and this is where this gets kind of nonsensical. I think we had a data type before that was related to room numbers. So I don't know what the logical context of this table is, but I'm going to add a field here called room number. And it's not going to be a key field or one with an initial value. And I want to go back to using a data type that's in the dictionary. So I'll search for it. And I want a data element here. And I'll just look for ones that I created previously. So um, I think I hopefully use ZN001 at the start of my data element name. 
and I didn't. I must have blessed you. Sometimes I get sloppy about that and, and leave off one of the zeros, and that's what I did. Okay, so you notice I have two user-defined ones here, um, Nick's room numbers. So I will uh, pick that guy right there and make that the data type. And then notice when I hit enter, it pulled in the description. Uh, room numbers in Nick's Hall. And then remember we created that other uh, data type. I'll add a field here called operator. And I'll similarly search for uh, the data type I defined previously. And here's my math operators. So once again, this database table makes no logical sense whatsoever, but it illustrates a table that has four fields some of which the data types are being pulled from other things defined in the ABOB dictionary, some of which are defined just in the context of the table, that being the data type of social security number. But I now have created a set of fields. I've designated the key fields, described which ones need to have an initial value. And it seems to me that if social security number is indeed going to be part of the key, that can't be null. So I'm going to have to make that one that will have an initial value. We'll assume that it makes sense for room number and arithmetic operators to be null. So I won't require initial values from them. And let's assume that this is my entire uh, set of fields that I want to use. Notice that the description is set for every one of these fields. I only actually typed in one of them because only one of them is strictly defined in the context of this table. Now, let's do a little bit of review. Why it is using the custom types here a useful thing? Why is that something we, we want to do from time to time? What's that? Well, Maybe, but I don't, how, how does it save me time? Okay, but I, I, your point is valid, but it's kind of downstream of what I think the, the best answer is here. What is, what is using a, a, a user-defined dictionary type do for me in the grand scheme of things? Why do we bother with it? Okay, I can create a domain and tie it to a data type. What does a domain do for me? Why do we create domains? It restricts the content to a valid set of values, okay? So I'm doing this to exert control. I create a domain that in this case defined a set of valid mathematic operators. And then I created a data type based on that domain. And now I have used that data type in the design of a database table, which makes it pretty clear that the math operators field should only have certain values in it. That being the values that are a part of the math operators related domain. All right, so you'll notice there are a couple of other tabs here. Input help. Well, you'll notice this, that for all of the things that are tied to um, already created data types in the ABOP dictionary, this has all been pulled in automatically. And this is akin to when you wrote a program previously, and if you did it correctly, when the user clicked on a field in the parameters in the parameters context, they got a search box automatically. That, that's what's going to happen here now because I'm using those data types that I've set up previously. And so I have a, a pretty well-defined, uh, not necessarily logically, but in terms of, uh, of, as an example, a set of database fields here. Now, there are other things that I have to maintain, but what I generally do as a way of navigating to those things is I'll just save this. I have to put it in the package that I'm using for this. You've been doing that with your development work this semester, and then I'll attempt to activate this. 
And when I attempt to activate screen, this is Albop's way of saying, hang on a second, you need to tell me more stuff. Well, you'll notice it's flashing on a field that says data class. Well, let's look at what that's all about. And this is a similar question to what we were asked before. What kind of data is this table going to contain? Is it going to contain master data? Is it going to contain, contain transaction data? Is it organization or customizing type data? And you'll notice the last two are related to business warehouse, um, which we won't use at all. And in fact, most of the tables that we create for this course will be transactional data tables. So I will choose APPL1. And then I also need to set right underneath it the size category. And so if I search there, you'll notice the different sizes. And this is where it's asking me to estimate how large do I think this table will be. And this is just so the underlying database can be alerted as to things like how much storage space it should inside and where you might actually want to put this. You notice my smallest table is 0 to 19,000 records. I can't imagine that we'll do anything this semester with a table we create that has more than 19,000 things in it. And I'm not going to tell you, create a database table and add 19,000 the rest of the semester to type that in. So we'll always be able to select that. But notice, um, we can pick a size <laughs> up to, I think that is uh, 3.1 billion records. Um, you know, you can see, you can pick. It has the ability to work with really, really large tables. The one above the last one, it tops out at, what is that, 70, 78 million records? Okay, so you know, we can accommodate pretty big tables here, but you're always going to pick table size 0 for 0 to 19,000, at least in the context of this class. Notice some of the other technical settings here, buffering allowed, buffering not allowed. We can just leave all of the defaults here because obviously we're not going to be doing real production work here. But things like we want all activity for this table to be logged. All we have to do is toggle that on and we'll make that happen. Don't do that. And in general, you have to be very, very careful about logging because that can generate a huge amount of system data if we have a table that's being used frequently. So if you have need to turn it on, this is where you would do it. But for the most part, we're going to leave these other values exactly as you see them here. Notice as well, we have a tab here called DB Specific Properties. We have really two choices here. We can make this a row store database table. We can make this a column store database table. Or undefined this means basically let the underlying DBMS decide how it wants to handle this based on the other settings. I just wanted to show you where that was. It's fine for us to leave it as undefined. At some point this semester, we may talk about the distinction between a row store and a column store database. But from our perspective at this point, it's not really something that we need to focus on. So let me save this and see where we are now. Remember, I was starting the activation process and I got diverted here. So I'll hit the back button, which brings me back into my request to activate. And things are looking up here. Uh, oh, and by the way, I just noticed I, I forget. I use um, Z035 as my class login, and I use Z001 outside of class. And I just realized I created this using my Z001 account. So. Uh, I have to remember not to be confused about that personally. So I will click check mark. And I see warnings occur. Now, remember the rule of thumb in programming, which is warnings aren't exactly a reason for joy, but warnings don't indicate that there's really a problem. Um, an error would be something that I would have to fix. A warning is just telling me, hey, um, Here's some feedback about what you just did. 
And at this point, if you wanted to, you could just say, no, I don't want to look at the log. Just, just create my table for me. But just in this context, we'll hit yes here for a moment. And you can see it says that we're missing the definition of an enhancement category. An enhancement category is not required, but if I did want to fix that, I could come back here and under extras, you'll see enhancement category listed. And it tells me, hey, right now your table is not classified. So this is what it's telling me in regards to enhancement category. But what is the enhancement category? We'll just look at the documentation. Uh, structures and tables that were defined by SAP in the ABAB dictionary can be enhanced subsequently by customers using customizing includes or appends. So the idea, you know, a, a user could go in, a developer could go in and add to an SAP table. The enhancements do not refer to structures tables themselves, but also depend on structures, blah, 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 blah. Basically, I have to decide whether I want my table to be able to be enhanced in the future or not. And notice my choices. Cannot be enhanced. That's pretty straightforward. The structure must not be enhanced. Can be enhanced and character like. All structure components and their enhancements must be character type, um, meaning that I can't use data dictionary things. Can be enhanced and character like or numeric. Can be enhanced in any way. Unclassified, um, you know, basically is pretty straightforward. We, we haven't made a choice here. So I could go in and say, you know, um, let's make it can be enhanced, character like, or numeric. Because I already hit the activate button and it did the activation and then gave me the warning, my can be enhanced deep is off the table. Had set this before I did the initial activation, that would be a choice available to me as well. You can not bother setting this because as we have observed, it is optional, but I'll go ahead and set it for the sake of, of our example here. And then I will redo the activation. And you notice this time every difficulty. Remember our rule of thumb, when I create a database table here in the ABAP dictionary, I can save it as I'm going along and then come back in the future and, and resume work on it because it's just what's called a transparent table. It's not actually something that exists in the underlying database. But when I activate it, at that point now, this database. And if my table allows somebody came in afterwards and added to the table definition and activated it, then that would cause the new design to be implemented in the underlying database. So we have now just created our first user-defined database that admittedly, logically, does not make a whole lot of sense. But we have a database table. Questions about this? Yes. That was, was that under, that was not here. I think, is that a technical setting? Yeah, technical settings. There's, there's a set of buttons here along the top. And technical settings is where we did that. But the way we actually got there in our workflow was we went to activate it, and it brought this up. But you could, you could do it this way and then activate, and, and you would just move right into the activation process. Okay. Other questions? All right, so I'm going to leave this open and go back to where we left off in our PowerPoint slides because one of the reasons why I wanted us to create a database table is for us to talk about the process of adding things to a database table. Now, at some point this semester, we might, emphasis on might, have you insert into a standard SAP system table. But that obviously is a task that has a 
peril to it, particularly as we are refining our ABAP skills, work and such, you'll be creating your own database tables and then inserting into them, much like we did here. And that's one of the things that you will have to do for your next homework assignment. So how do I put stuff into a database table? You will notice I have three variations here. I can say insert into, then the name of my database table, values, and then a structure or work area, the record that I want to put into the database. The other alternative does the exact same thing, just slightly different syntax, insert name of the database table from name of the structure. And then lastly, insert name of the database table from table. So now I'm not pointing this at a structure, but I'm pointing this at an internal table that may have a whole number of records created. And as a point of fact, it is not uncommon program for our program to populate an internal table when it's finished or as a part of its processing, take that internal table and add it to the database. Now, I'm not saying that we will do that necessarily in our programs because we won't be working with necessary huge volumes of data, but should that be appropriate, that's the syntax for how we do this. So let's, let's write a little program to work with the database table that, uh, that we just created. And so um, I'm going to refer back to the fields here, but I also, in another window, need my ABOP Workbench Editor. So let me open up a program here. And I think I've pretty much just been reusing this guy every time. And so uh, let me make this editable. And uh, we'll follow a pattern that is pretty typical, which is we'll get values from the user and use those to put into this database table. So my fields were, my, my first field I know was the Mont field. Do I need to ask the user for the client number? No. I mean, that doesn't make sense on any level. We'll talk about the client here in a moment, but clearly that's not something I need to ask the user about. But I do need to ask the user for their social security number. All right, so I'm going to call this parameters uh, SSN, because that's under my eight character letter, uh, type. And remember, there's several different ways I could do this, but arguably the best way is for me to list the name of my table, which is ZN001 underscore demo223, I think is what I called my table, uh, very inartfully. And then the name of the field is SSN. Now, there are a couple of things that it would behoove me to think about at this point. Whenever we use a parameter statement, um, what's a good question to ask myself before I just hit the period here and move on to the next line? Is it required? And if the answer to that is yes, then I have to make this obligatory. My question to you is, is this uh, optional or is it required? Okay, why do you assert that it's required? I made it a key field. So the, I got to get this from the user. So this will, in fact, be obligatory. Now, remember, the other thing that I could incorporate here was value check. But value check is going to check this against the data domain definition. I didn't do a data domain definition for this. So typing value check here would not be a syntax error, but it wouldn't add any value because there's no way for the system to do a value check. So there's my first parameter. Uh, I'll do a second parameter. And uh, the next field I had in my table design here was room number. Okay? Uh, that's too many letters because, remember, I can only use eight letters here. 
for a parameter's name, so I'll just call this rm type zn001 underscore demo223 dash room number. Now, is this obligatory? In the context of my database design, it is not obligatory. Is it obligatory in the context of this program? That's a question you would have to decide as a developer, okay? But my, my whole database table is kind of like Alice in the Wonderland, you know, really made up to begin with here. So I'm just going to say, no, it's not obligatory. But I will say I do want you to do a value check on this for me. And let's see how that works out. And then I have one other thing that I want to get from the user, and that is the other field here, which is operator. And I'll just use op as the, as the data object name, type zn001 underscore demo223 dash operator for my data type. And I'm going to just arbitrarily say, yes, this is obligatory. And, and yes, I want there to be a value check. So I haven't really done anything magical or new at this point. Uh, let's uh, do a syntax check just to make sure I haven't made any typos. And it looks like I'm pretty good here. And now I get to a, a part that's kind of clunky about this. I want to put this into my database table, which means that this has to be in a work area or structure. Well, I don't have a work area or structure already created at this point. And so I'm going to have to write some code that's not very complicated, but it's just kind of annoying that I have to do this. And so I'll do data, and I'll call it uh, data wa type. Now here's something that I don't know that we've talked about. We have talked about before creating a work area to match an internal table. And we've said for that is a data wa like line of name of my internal table. So I can't. So now the question is, what do I use here for type? Well, what I could do is I could use a type statement. I could create a structure that has all these fields in it, and then I could make a data object based on that. But quite frankly, that's a lot more typing than I want to do, and it's making my code more verbose than I want it to be. There's another way that I can get a type definition for structure, and that is to pattern it after a database table, not an internal table, but a database table. If I want to pattern my data object after a line in my database table, all I do is list the name of the database table. So I now have a data object. I know that because it's a data statement. And it matches a record in zn001 underscore demo223. Anytime I do stuff like this, I like to check it. You can see syntax is just great. So I now have, and there's no way around this. I'm going to have to write some code here that's pretty mind-numbing. What I'm going to have to do is say uh, WA dash, and now I've got to make sure I match the field names in my database table. SSN equals SSN. So what I'm doing is I'm copying my value into my work area. And then WA dash, uh, I think it, well, we can see right here, it's room number uh, equals RM. And WA dash operator equals O, not zero, OP. So uh, some housekeeping there but I trust not code that I really need to explain. I've loaded up my work here. So now we're at pay dirt, which is insert into ZN001 underscore demo 223 values WA. 
Now comes the fun. Syntax check. I, I trust that you believe me when I say that our existing database table is empty, but just to prove it, if I come out here and say display, and then I say, let's look at the contents of the table uh, and do number of entries. We can see that there's nothing in the table, okay? So let's see if we can change that. So I will run my program. And, okay, it's asking for a social security number. One, two, or remember we said that this was obligatory, right? But let's also observe the fact that because I'm going back else, the user could put in a social security number of 12. If I had used a defined data type and tied it to a domain, I could make sure they gave me a nine digit number that started with a non-zero. But I don't have that option here. So I've left myself open for the user being a bit of a smart aleck here and just typing in that their social security number is 12. For room, notice I get the search that tells me room should be a number from 100 to 499. But I don't remember, did we say to value check this or not? We did say to value check this. So let's see what happens if the user tries to put a three in here. And then for operator, uh, you see we have the choices here. I'll pick multiplication. So the user is asking me, or uh, the user is telling me, this is what I want you to put in the database, execute. And you'll notice I got enter a valid value for the room number because it's not within the specified range. This is the virtue of having a, a domain. So 101 is a valid room number. And so now I hit execute and looks like nothing happened. And that's because in my program, there's no logic at all after I did the insert. There's nothing that produces a message to the user that says, yay, there's no error checking, there's no nothing. But in fact, my program did run, and now if we go back and hit number of entries, we can see that there's one entry in the database. And in fact, if we look at the database, there we go. Now what do you notice about what you're seeing right there? It filled in the, the other digits with, with zeros. It zero padded it. Um, what else do you notice? We talked about this, but I just want to make sure you see it here. It automatically put in the client number. Remember, I didn't, I didn't in any way reference the client number in my program. Mont was not a part of my... Um, of my setting values. Not only did I not ask the user for Mont, I didn't in WA put a value for Mont. It just took it. Now, just for fun, if such a thing can be called fun, uh, let's see what happens if we were to have done this. WA-MANDT equals 444. Okay? hard coding that in, which is of course a very bad thing to do. But let's execute this now. Uh, one, two, three, uh, three, three, three. Um, I like the plus sign. Execute. And let's go back. Data browser. Um, back up. Number of entries in the table, two. Look at the table. Now, that's curious, isn't it? put my data from the user in the table, and it said, and I'm ignoring that because I know better, and I know that the client number here should be 313. So it has basically kept me from creating something that could hypothetically have been a security violation under the underlying data model here. Questions about any of this? Now, my program at this point right now is very, very bad because I neglected to do a critical thing, which is to check to see if the data did what I wanted it to do. And I do that by checking SY-SUBRC. And if it's equal to zero, I know it was successful. 
if it's return value of four, which is the most common error I might see, that means insertion is not possible as what I'm asking it to put in violates the key. So let's go back in and adjust our program and then also play around with this a little bit. So what I really should have is code that looks like this. Insert into, and then after that, if sy-subrc is not equal to zero. Okay, if, if it's zero, things are good. But if I got something other than a zero, I know I, I had a problem here, so I could say write, Error value not inserted into DB. And then depending on my program, um, I might want to terminate the program at this point. I'll show you some other alternatives that we can employ a little bit later. But otherwise, I'll just do else, which means I did get a zero. And what I'm going to do right out here is I'll write, oops, got to put a period at the end of that. And I'm going to write out on a new line um, sy dash db count new values. Since this is numeric, that's a good idea. And since that is that, I got to put it there. And I need an end if statement. And let me do a syntax check to make sure I've got all my spaces in the right place. And I figured that I hadn't. Let's see, this means this has to go not there. So before we run this, the big thing to keep in mind here is every time, every time, every time, every time, every time, every time I do an insert, I need to do a check like this, okay? Because otherwise I could be giving the user a false set of security. So let's run this and see what happens. Run and uh, social security, one, two, three, four, five, Room number 222, operator, divide by. Execute, one new value's added. That looks pretty good. Okay, now what did I, I just did uh, one, two, three, four, five. Let's see what happens if I try to put in one, two, three, four, five again with a room number of one, 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 and we'll still leave it as division. We know that this should cause a key violation, right? Because I just put in one with that same social security number, and social security number is part of the key. Execute error value not inserted into DB. This looks pretty good. This is behaving the way that I would want this to, in fact, behave. Questions about any of this so far? So here's the important thing. When I try and insert one record, which would be the first two lines there. I know that I'm going to get back zero for success or four, meaning, hey, the record you tried to give me didn't work. I couldn't put it in there. So here's the question for you. Suppose I use the third option and I feed the statement an internal table with 10 records in it. And of the 10, seven of them go but three of them have key violations. And so they database table. What, what happens then? Do I get none of them? Do I get seven of them? Um, how does that play out? Well, for the from table option, the third one, if even one line of the internal table cannot be inserted due to the duplicate key in the database table, 
the entire operation is rolled back. In other words, if it can't put all of them in, it's not going to put any of them in. That's the default way that it will work if I'm inserting from an internal table. Now, you might say, hold on a second. Suppose if I feed it 10 and 7 of them are I want it to go ahead and put the set in and just throw the other three away. And we can imagine a scenario where that may, might make sense, maybe where hypothetically you have two database tables and you take the first database table and you copy it to an internal table, you do maintenance on it, and then you want to insert that into the second database table with the idea being if the customer's already in the second table, you don't want to touch the record, but if they aren't, you want to put it in. So in that situation, it would make sense to say, put in the ones you can and ignore the ones you can't. How do I do this? If I want all of the valid rows to be inserted, you add the statement accepting duplicate keys. So you would say insert DB table from table internal table accepting duplicate keys. This strikes me as one of the most horrible syntax things I've ever seen before. Because if we stopped right now and I asked you, what does that mean? You might very logically say, well, I guess it's going to override the database restriction on unique keys and it's going to put duplicate keys in the database table. And that is not what will happen. What will actually happen is it will skip over the duplicate rows but put the, but put the non-violated rows in just fine. So my argument with this is I get the operation. The operation is desirable, but describing that operation as accepting duplicate keys makes it seem different than what really is going to happen here. So let me just talk through it one more time to make sure understand the scenario. I have an internal table with 10 records in it. Eight of them are good. Two of them would cause a key violation because they duplicate a table key. If I use insert DB table exactly as it happens here on the third row, nothing gets put in because if any of the records are bad, they're all thrown away. And I, of course, would get an SYSUBRC of four. But if I add duplicate keys, the ones that can go in, go in, and the ones that can't, don't. Questions? Yes. Yes, insert DB table from table internal table, accepting duplicate keys. Mm -hmm. SY-SUBRC is going to be set to four. Even if I add accepted duplicate keys to the syntax, SY-SUBRC is going to be set to 4 as a way of telling me at least some of these records didn't go in. Okay, So let's make sure we understand that. If my internal table has five records in it and all five of them can go in, that's going to happen and SY-SUBRC is going to be set to, five, or to, be set to 0. Success. If I say accepting duplicate keys and I throw five records out there and four of them can go in and one cannot, the four that can go in will, SY-SUBRC is going to be set to four to tell you at least one record didn't go in and SYDB count is going to be set to how many rows actually went in. So at this point, I could check to see the size of my internal table and well first of all if, if SYSUBRC is set to four I know there was a problem but here's the thing which records went in and which didn't I have no way of knowing now I'd have to add logic to my program to try and deduce that that's why we're headed down a path that just strikes me as bad programming in most instances, okay? But this is options that are available to us in crafting these statements. Now, I have one more really important fact to tell you, which is, OPOP assumes 
that as a developer, you will not shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> Isn't that just a horrible assumption for it to make? Now, what, what do I mean by that? Okay, if, if we use our program right here that we've been playing around with, and I'm going to put in a valid key, and I'm going to say room number um, 999, which I think is out of range. And for operator, I'm going to put in the opening parenthesis. And I execute this. Notice it's not going to take it because my parameter statement is going to do a value check. I'm going to fail the value check. I'm not leaving this screen. So there's no way stuff is going into my database that's bogus. But let's look at this alternative. I'm going to comment out the parameters because in my example program now, I'm not going to ask the user for any parameters at all. And we already observed that this line gets ignored. And what I'm going to do is this, is I'm going to do WA social security number, and I'm going to put in one that I'm pretty sure uh, isn't there already. So I'm going to do um, 9999. And for room number, I'm pretty sure that zero was an invalid room number. And for operator, I know that the opening paren is an invalid operator. So I now have some values loaded up in my work area that should not go into my database because they violate the domain definition. Let's see what happens when I run this guy. Boop, one new value added. Let's go back to uh, my looking at the contents of the table. Don't think there's any way I can refresh this, so I'll have to go back out and execute it. And there we go. There's my invalid room number, and there's my opening parenthesis, just as, as big as, as all day. Now, um, because it does not enforce domain validation on code written explicitly by the developer. Or as I put it on the PowerPoint slide here, domain restrictions are not enforced on programmatic data insertion. Now let's look and see what happens if I try and insert a duplicate key number. Okay, My 9999 is already there. I'll just try and add another one of there with a room number of 10 and a closing paren. But I, I clearly have a key violation here because there's already uh, a key in there with that social security number, and we see that that does trigger an error. Okay, so it is going to protect me from messing up my key, but it's not going to enforce domain restrictions. And if you think about, you know, why does this happen? It actually makes perfect sense if we understand the architecture. Here's the the DBMS. This is where the table is sitting. My program is going to send to the DBMS an insert statement. And it's going to get back uh, an error code or some kind of message. Well, my program resides here on the application layer. If you think about this, setting aside anything to do with OPOP, it makes sense that if my application sends a message to this database and says insert something that's going to violate the key definition in the database, the database is going to complain and say, oh, no, you don't. We can't do that. We no longer have integrity. I reject your request to insert. And it's going to throw it back at me. But if all that's happened here That meant that in this DBMS down here, there's a field that has been set up probably to take in integers. So as long as I feed it a valid integer, if I feed it a 9, for example, it has no trouble doing that insert. Now, it violates the logic that should be being enforced on the application layer. But if I choose 
to write my program poorly on the application layer, the database layer isn't going to complain. Now let's go back here and just to illustrate that, if I were to say, and I'm trying to figure out how we could even do this, if I were to put here for a room number, I don't think this would even make sense. I don't, if I said room number equals apple, I think I'm going to get a syntax error here, but let's just see. Oh, look at that. Uh, one new value added. This is going to be fun. Let's look and see. I just tried to make apple uh, a room number, and a room number should be a numeric character three digits long. Uh, oh, display, and then table contents. So what did it do? It, it just zeroed it out, right? I mean, and I forget, it, it didn't even give me an error message, right? It just, it just said, hey, I put it in there, but we can see quite clearly it did. This is why on my end, I need to be very, very careful about things like doing value check and using obligatory because the database is happy to accept garbage no garbage at it. So don't do that in your program. Questions? That's like, could I do what you suggested, which is have a whole bunch of values in an internal table, loop through them, and handle them one at a time? And the answer to that is, yeah, I could do that. I could, for example, look up my internal table and do, what did we talk about, loop at, which allows me to loop through that internal table, and then I could, inside of that, have insert statements. Now, let's think about it. If we really wanted to be sophisticated about this, we could do something like this. We could do an insert and try and insert the whole internal table. And if it takes it, life's good. If it doesn't, we could do something that we haven't yet talked about, which is I could roll that back. And I could say, okay, you could take all of them, so don't take any of them. Give me those back. And then I could do the, the, the loop at and go record by record. And then I'd know which were good and which were bad. So that's just hypothetically a way we could structure the logic. Try and do all of them. If all of them go in at once, then we're done. And if not, then go record by record so that I know which goes in and which doesn't. But that's just one example of a way we could structure the logic. But you're definitely thinking along the right lines. Now, we're not done, but I want to, for a moment here, detour and talk to you about your next homework assignment. Because at this point, you should know enough to complete your next homework assignment. Let's look at it together. Create a system for keeping track of information about your friends. And this assignment provides you with a general specification. You must use your skill, experience, and knowledge of best coding practices to design a solution. Many elements of this assignment can be solved in different ways. Maximum credit And then I talk about you should use data domains, where data domains would be helpful. And I remind you of the coding standard and other things like that. Um, but let's look at this. General specification. You wish to develop a system for tracking the following information about your friends. Their middle initial, their last name, their title, which must include at minimum the following options, Mr., Mrs., Miss, Ms., Dr., Prof., and Coach. You can add other titles to that list at your discretion, but at minimum those have to be there. Their birth month, based on standard text names, January, February, March, etc. Their birth day, which would be a number between 1 and 31. No, I'm not asking for their year. Uh, their email address, their friend rating, which must include at minimum the following ratings, super, average, poor, and questionable, okay? You can add more to that list if you want. Their city residence, their state. Now, if we were gonna be really precise about this, we'd go into the domain and we'd define all 50 states. There's no sense in you doing that. 
So I'm saying go in and from all your friends, just live in five different states. Put five states in there. Um, a comment field where you could write a note about your friend. Uh, and if you want to add some more stuff to this, you can. But I'm not encouraging you to expand that list. It's already pretty good. Now, I don't want to talk specifics, but I will throw out to you the observation that it makes sense that some of those fields might be valid to be null. And clearly, some of them are going to be required. And you really just need to think through that on your own and consider how you want to handle it. So there's a good chunk of work right there because you're going to probably want to define some domains. You're going to probably want to create some data types. And then you're going to have to create an ABOP table in the data dictionary for the database. So once you've done that, now I want you to write two programs. Program one, you wish to manage your system by a program that allows you to add new friends to the database. This program will, pump, will prompt the user as needed to collect the data noted above, and then, if appropriate, add that information to the database. User prompting should be clear in all respects. Make sure your program only allows complete valid data to be entered into the database. This means that not all fields, should say, are required. Okay, so it might be valid for a particular field not to be set to something, but otherwise your program should use techniques that, quite frankly, we've already illustrated quite clearly in our time together today to make sure that no bad data gets into the database and proper control is, is exerted. So that's program one. Program two, you wish to have a program that allows the user to select among a set of reports which your program then prepares and outputs to the screen. So this is real similar to already written, except instead of you going out to the SP fly table and pulling data down and dumping it to the screen, you're now going to go out to your table and pull in data and dump it to the screen. And I want you to put the data a few different ways based on what the user uses. One of the choices, just an alphabetic list of friends that shows their name with their title and email address. So, you know, Dr. Ron Smith smith at smith.com. Report number two, a list of friends that shows their name, title, their city and state, sorted by state, then city, then last name. So Dr. Ron Smith, Johnson City, Tennessee. And the idea would be that in the table, the, let's say Alabama's would be first, then Tennessee's, and so on, respecting the stored order defined here. A list of friends divided by their friend rate, okay? A list of friends and their birthdays. And then one other report of your own choosing, and you got a lot of potential things that you can put into this report. But let's be clear with program number two, the user's going to start your program, and the user's going to have to pick one of these reports using some mechanism whereby you ask the user to make a choice among a fixed set of values where there is only one valid selection. There's something you know how to do that would enable you to do that. And then your program is going to have additional logic that basically says, the user chose this, output this report. The user chose this, OK, output this report. So you'll get some practice with putting data out there. In order to do program number two, you may or may not want to employ an internal table. You know, there's lots of different techniques that you would want to think through. But program two is not unlike things that we have already done. You're just doing it in the context of your own table. Notice some of my uh, just additional thoughts here. You need to verify that the birth of the month of birth is valid. They can't say that they were born in June Tober or something like that. Um, and you need to make sure that the day is a valid number between one and 31. But I'm not requiring you to date check. You know, you don't have to throw out February 31st. You don't have to check whether it was a leap year. You know, you can just validate it based on days. And you don't need to validate the city. You know, if they put in that they're from Jerktown, you'll take that, okay? Even though there may not be a Jerktown, Alabama. 
Um, so um, those are some allowances that I, I'm making there. You'll notice that I've said at the beginning and then I reiterate here at the end, there's probably a lot of design type decisions that are implied but not explicitly stated. Think through those. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer questions, but realize I may very well answer your question with, that's up to you and your design. Yes, sir. No, 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 the output, I mean, you could, hypothetically, if you wanted to, uh, I'm not going to say you can't, but I'm just envisioning uh, a table type output that would be the equivalent of if you loaded it up into Excel and sorted by, you know, in this case, you're sorting by their name and email address. In this case, you're sorting by uh, state, then city, then last name, and so, um, no values just wouldn't even appear in the output, okay? Questions? All right, we have a few minutes left. Let's look at one more uh, database-related command, update. Update is, you know, standard database operation. I can use this to update or change a single record, or a single update could, in fact, affect multiple records. Think about it with insert a moment ago upon what version of the insert statement I chose, I was going to affect one record or multiple records, or zero records. Uh, with update, one of my choices is update, name of the table, from structure, name of a work area. And what's going to happen here is very similar to what we saw with the internal table, whereby the system is going to look at the structure find the key field values, match those up with the key field values in the table, and then use that to update the matching record. Variation two, much more explicit. Update, name of the database table, set, field equals value, field equals value, field equals value, as many or as few as those as I need, where, key field equals value, and key field equals value, and so on. So this could look something like update DB table, set state equals null, where state equals California, because California just succeeded, you know, hypothetically in my example, okay? That operation would affect a lot of people that had California as their state, okay? So this version of the update could wind up changing no records. It could change one record. Obviously, it could change a whole bunch of them. Only the field specified in the set. Other fields are left the way they are, okay? That's why the field value pair in the set portion of the statement becomes very, very clear. And the values there could be hard-coded values or they could be variables in the context of a program. If the conditions specified in the WHERE clause are not unique, then multiple records might be changed. And the example I talked through a moment ago where state equals California presumably have the potential to hit a whole bunch of different records and so those would be affected. The other variation here, I don't know why I didn't bold the word update here, but nonetheless, the third variation, update DB table from table, internal table. So same kind of operation, but now it's going to go through and it's going to go row by row and essentially employ the logic of the second, well, I guess it's going to go row by row and employ the logic from the first option. So it's going to look at the first record, find the key fields, look for the record that matches it in the, in the database table, and if it finds it, updates all the values accordingly. SY-SUBRC is going to be set as a result of this operation. If my update was successful, I get back a zero. If 
my update wasn't possible. Now, keep in mind, that could mean that it just didn't find the need to do an update, not necessarily that my update caused a logic problem. It's just I asked an update where state equals New Jersey, and I don't have any people in my database that have New Jersey as a state. That's going to give me a four. Update wasn't possible. So I do have to kind of contextualize thinking about this in the context of my program. Will tell me how many rows were updated. Which, if you think about it, for the first one, I'm expecting that to be one. For the second one, who knows how many it could be? It could be one, it could be five, it could be 5,000. And same thing with the third option. So, SYDB count is something that is very particularly useful here. Questions? Yes. Absolutely. Which is why we're not doing our practice on real system database tables because you could very clearly uh, cause some major havoc here. Let me go and show you this one because it's just so similar. Um, modify. Modify is really, really similar to insert, but what's going to happen is this. If the record that matches up with my key values is not there, it's going to treat it like an insert. If it is there, it's going to treat it like an update. So I could, for example, say modify the database table from the structure. The structure contains all kinds of new information, or it contains all kinds of information about my friend. You don't have to do this, by the way, for your homework, but just as an example. So it's going to it's going to go look at DB table and see whether that friend exists. And if they don't, it's just going to put that as a new friend in the table. But if it finds that that friend does exist based on key field matches then it's just going to treat it like an update situation. So modify is actually pretty useful. And I suppose you could make the case that you could just take insert out of your brain and always use modify. Um, but it depends on the logic of what you're trying to accomplish. You see the two different ways working from either an individual structure or an internal table, and the SY-SUBRC working in the same fashion as we described previously. Any questions about this? All right. Well, this, I think, is a good place for us to stop. So we will do so. See you guys next week. Even though your homework isn't due until later in the week than normal next week, I would really encourage you to work on it before next class period. And we can take some time at the beginning of class on Tuesday and handle any questions that you might have. Don't forget to sign in if you have not already done so. Have a great rest of the day.